wonderful. So that's coming up for this summer. And the second announcement is of major significance. And I think I would, it would be wonderful for all of you to know that recently the Board of Trustees at Hope College has promoted Dr. Johnson to full professorship <laughs> at Hope College. Very well deserved. You guys are so much kinder than my sister who when I told her she went and Well, I was glad to share that with you. And I think you're ready to start yes, our final session. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good good morning, scholars of Hast. I, I thought we were gonna dim the lights or you're gonna, gonna keep them up. Okay, okay, Tom, thank you. Well, look, we're gonna get started. You know, we've been Africa. And as Kit pointed out, this is session three, Eye of the Storm, Africa in the Eye of the Storm in the 20th and 21st centuries. So we were talking last week about Europe's chickens coming home to roost and that Picture you see on the far left is Cecil Rhodes, who was known as the colonizer of colonizers when it came to the African continent. And Europe's chickens did eventually come home to roost. Primarily, when you look at this, I told you all I did not, I did not spend as much time on African resistance movements to colonization, but I did not want to leave without us understanding that Africans did resist and in a big way, north, south, east, and west across the continent from colonization. So it wasn't that Europeans just showed up one day, rolled into the continent and took everything over. Now, the fact that they did it between 1885 and 1900 is pretty spectacular. I mean, however you, however you might feel about colonization and exploitation, the mere fact that Europe could take over a continent that is big enough to fold America and Europe and part of Asia into it is stunning. And they did it in 15 years at the end of the 19th century and at the start of the 20th century. You see in the far, in West Africa, Samari Touré, we talked about him very briefly last week, but there was also the Asante Rising, Satiru Uprising, the Bedouin Resistance in the East African part, we see German East Africa, also known as Kenya and Tanzania, the Muslim Arab Revolt. I always have difficulty when you talk about, for example, during the transatlantic slave trade, slave mutinies. Can people who are being enslaved, but they resist that, is that a mutiny? I mean, it's got to be something else. I don't know what it is, but it's not a mutiny. Europe's, Europe's chickens came home to roost in 1914. After colonizing Africa, Europeans then started bickering about their claims on the African continent. And those bickering between European nations about their possessions on the African continent, their claims on the African continent, spilled over into hostilities that have been long and festering inside of Europe. So the difficulties that they were having about Africa made difficulties in, in Europe relating even all the more acute. And that eventually contributed to the catastrophe that we know as World War I. World War I opened the doorway for African troops or col colonial African troops to be taken from West Africa and East Africa to the continent. Now, look, the thing about colonization was this, Africans, and African Americans have been told for many generations that they were barely human beings or the question of their humanity was very much in doubt. And there was something at the end of the 19th century called scientific racism, where if you're wondering how these things persist down to the 21st century, it's because learned people spent a lot of time studying differences between eth eth ethnic groups and different races of people and writing long books and treatises about why these people are different from this one, why this one was different from that one, and so on and so forth. And it became pretty much a canon of the higher academic world. Then it said the differences between people were natural. To take, a, to take a simple example we can talk about very quickly, I mentioned to you Charles Darwin, who when he came back from his journeys with the HMS Beagle, and he published his book in 1859, Origin of the Species, which was dedicated to just nature. And then Herbert Spencer, took Charles Darwin's st statements about natural selection and said that if that applies to nature, why can't it not apply to human society? That is, there are people who are naturally selected to dominate, and people who are naturally selected to be dominated by. It's real convenient as an excuse to give yourself an on-ramp for colonization. By 1945, take a look at this map. Now here's Africa in 1914. You see all that orange in the western part of the, the western part of the country, rather the western part of the continent. 
That's all French West Africa. Look at it in 1945. It still is pretty much the same. Now that is a, admittedly a map from 19, 1914, but I, I put it up there again to show that even after two world wars, the situation of colonial domination in Africa had not changed. And again, I'll tell you this, the only thing that wasn't there, the, only, the big difference was that in 19, by 1900, the only two nations that had not been conquered by the Europeans were Ethiopia in the east, in the Horn of Africa, and Liberia in the west, right next to Sierra Leone. And this is where America's chickens come home to roost. Because having paid no attention really to the continent for a long, long time, now it's the Cold War. And because the United States has, the United States and the Soviet Union has supplanted both England and France as the dominant colonial actors inside of the African continent, we've got to take a look at what happened from 1945 to 1950, because that is a very, very busy period. Now, when I tell my students that, you know, 1945 was all that long ago, they'll get me cross. I'm like, what are you talking about? Isn't that when the ancient Romans were alive? <laughs> no, it was the middle of the 20th century. We only left the 20th century, what, about 22 years ago? So their perspective is somewhat skewed, if, you, if, if I may say so. But from 1945 to 1950, think about it like this. World War II ends. There's a good feeling. The Cold War begins. With the Cold War beginning, England and France have been through not one, but two major catastrophes, two major world wars that have sapped their national, intellectual, and economic vitality. To have colonies requires having the military strength to dominate people and the economic, the economic flexibility to be able to capitalize on your domination. They don't have that anymore. The United States and the Soviet Union arise out of World War II as not just world powers, but superpowers, especially in the case of the United States, because in America, we have nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons Okay. Hang on a second. Do you have any gray box so everybody at home and Okay. Okay. From 1945 to 1950, what it changes. In 1945, you get this on the far left. By 1950, you get hydrogen weapons. You know, I, I heard an NPR story, that lady who, the, the lady in the picture who's being kissed here, she spent decades trying to figure out who was that guy that kissed me. They eventually discovered her and she was like in her 80s, I think, she still remembered the kiss. We had gone from, we had gone from the kiss of a, of a random sailor to a random nurse to the United States and the Soviet Union that are at odds with each other. 1945, you'll see just what I told you, this is from 1945, you still have French West Africa, British East Africa, Italian East Africa, particularly with Somalia, Pay attention to that region called the Ogaden, which is right next to Ethiopia and the, the yellow there. Also what's going on in 1945, right into World War II, this is, a, this is a map also of colonized Asia. Clearly you see China, there's a good part, you see Great Britain is dominating India and Burma, parts of Malay and the British, British Borneo, the United States is dominating in the Philippines, by 1945, the colonized world had gotten to a point where it said, enough is enough. Enough with colonization. Things were on the move. And particularly when it came to promises from the West, in this case, I'm using the example of Woodrow Wilson, who in 1918, when he went to Versailles, particularly in 1919, when he went to the Versailles Conference, the Peace Conference, 
that was supposed to settle all of the claims and dis dis discussions and confusions about World War I, Woodrow Wilson arrived in Versailles after a long campaign and many speeches about how the world needs to be a better place. You know, this was the war to end all wars. It was the war to make the world safe for democracy. It was the war that can't be another war. Everything about World War I. And Woodrow Wilson went there with his 14 points. The 14th point, which was the most important to him, the establishment of a League of Nations, an association of nations to keep the peace. This was something called collective security that went all the way back to 1815 with something called the Concert of Europe, which was implemented at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The idea being just like Article 5 of NATO. If you attack one of us, you should be prepared to attack all of us because we will interpret a one, an attack upon one of us as an attack upon all of us because for our own collective security, we will band together. It is a way of offsetting the power of an actor that has become too much of a major threat. Many people in the 21st century looked at the US as being a unipolar threat because of our expanded power economically and of course, militarily. So Woodrow Wilson goes to Versailles talking about the dignity of all people and all nations being having autonomous destinies and people being able to choose their own futures, saying all the kind of things that colonized and dominated people would be interested in hearing. We want you to have the freedom of the seas, open, open treaties, no more obscurations such as what happened before World War I. People who have been dominated, we should find a new way of doing something other than colonization. And it sounds good, obviously, to people who have been colonized. But in 1945, by 1945, the United States has bigger fish to fry. In 1945, and into 1950, what you've got is a map of Europe that looks like this. Now, what I'm talking about are competing geostrategic in interests. The Soviet Union, and this is, this is part of the thing that kind of sort of puzzles me about you know, all, the, all the frothing and fuming about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine today. It is right that NATO and the United States is standing up to Vladimir Putin, and I'm glad they are. But the, the, the Russian president's response to the encroachment of the West is not unusual. Is what the czars did, is what the commissars did. The Russians have always been very leery and wary of the rest, the West, and for good reasons. They were invaded by the Swedes. They were invaded by the French. They were invaded by the Germans. And the, and the Russian people in World War II lost to 27 million people. Leningrad was under siege for two years. You know, I know that during the Cold War, it's very, very inappropriate to say, if you don't want to be accused of being a Russian sympathizer, or worse yet, a communist, to give the Russians any kind of credit for what they went through in World War II. But the fact of the matter is that the Russians held down the Eastern Front and pretty much the only game in town from most of 1941 through 1942, frankly, up until about 1943. They tied up a tremendous amount of German resources and time. So when they pushed from the East, from the West, from the East going West, when they, got into, when they got into Western or Eastern Europe, as one of my history props said in, in, uh, in high school, where the Russian army went, where the Red Army went, they stayed because they intended that to be a buffer between them and Russia proper. In other words, the next time a Western power comes to, de decides to invade Russia, by the time they actually get to Russia itself, we're going to make it so punishing and painful for them to where they will not be able to do it at all. Or they have to think twice about it. So this is, the, this is the situation. And that situation included, that Eastern Bloc included a place called Germany. Now, if you look at a map of Africa compared to, compared to Europe, you have a Soviet Union, which is dominating a lot of Eastern Europe. And of course, what they call Eurasia. And then you have colonized Africa. Inside of Europe, you have Germany, which was divided into the British zone, the French zone, the American zone, and the Soviet zone. You will notice that inside the Soviet zone, there was the city of Berlin, which was also divided into the Soviet zone, the French zone, the American zone, and the Russian zone. Well, the French, the Americans, and the British, and the Russians. In 1948, the Russians decide that they're going to cut off land access into East Germany, and therefore make it difficult for the French the British and the Americans to get to Berlin by land. The British and the Americans' response is to begin supplying their allies inside of Berlin by the air. So for a year, there's something called the Berlin Airlift. It is a public relations disaster for the Russians. And if anybody had any kind of doubt 
as to the level of hostility between the East and the West, the Berlin airlift closed off all that doubt. It turned out that the Russians were literally willing to starve people in various parts of Berlin into submission to keep them in there, to keep them inside of the Russian sector, which meant that, you know, they're not gonna let them get out. Well, what nation that calls itself a free enterprise or a free state has to work so hard to keep people in? More than that, why do people wanna leave? So it brings the Cold War into stark reality. While all that's going on, in the meantime, let's take a step back. Because in Asia, some things are happening as well that will influence American decisions when it comes to Africa. We see that in September 1945, that Japan invaded French Indochina and occupied the country with little resistance. Little resistance because from the, from the perspective of the Vietnamese, being invaded by the French or dominated by the French or dominated by the Japanese, one ruler is as bad as another one. Although the Japanese did put an accent on just how bad a ruler you could be. In 1941, Ho Chi Minh and his communist allies established, established a League for Independence of Vietnam. In March 1945, Japanese troops carried out a coup against French authorities and then announced an end to the colonial era, declaring Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia independent. This is the Japanese continuing to operate in the fiction that when they started doing what they did in the Pacific, they wanted, they wanted it to be the Asian for the Asia for the Asians. What they meant was Asia for the Japanese to establish this thing called the Greater East Asia Cold Prosperity Sphere. Then of course, in August, 1945, with the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima first, and then Nagasaki second on August 6th and 9th respectively, Japan surrendered and this formal surrender ceremony was held on the USS Missouri on September 2nd, 1945. Now, while the Japanese were fighting in Indochina, the United States was also there as well in the form of, at least in one instance, in the form of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner of the Central Intelligence Agency. One of the individuals who was there operating with the OSS was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was working with the OSS to help downed American pilots or carrying out guerrilla raids or doing anything they could to harass the Japanese. You see there in that picture, Ho Chi Minh is standing with a guy named Major Alassane Thomas. The intersection of where Ho Chi Minh and American interests begin to converge for a moment happens on September 2nd, 1945. Ho Chi Minh was a fan of the United States. And look, I, I was corrected up a Muskegon, up a Muskegon and rightly so by a Vietnam veteran who reminded me very emphatically that Ho Chi Minh was not some fuzzy teddy bear. He was a ruthless guy who would do what he was gonna do to get his way and he was ruthless. So the North Vietnamese, the, the Viet Minh, they could be as ruthless as any other dictatorial regime on earth and blooding people to get their way. But at this particular moment in time, for this, this inflection point, Ho Chi Minh had studied the United States and knew enough about the United States to know our revolutionary past that once we had been a colonial a society dominated by British colonizers ourselves, we had staged a revolution. No one thought it was going to work. No one on earth thought they, that these American farmers who were poorly led, if led at all, and led by a gentleman farmer named George Washington stood a chance against the British who had one of the world's biggest battle-hardened, battle-tested, battle-tried, battle-successful armies on earth to include a Navy. We have no Navy, we have no army, we have no officer corps. No one gives us the chance of winning and yet we did. So that example to many people around the world sets America up as a nation whose history is rooted in revolutionary struggle and therefore should identify other people who are involved in a revolutionary struggle to become independent. Ho Chi Minh approaches it from that standpoint and he uses our founding documents to even justify what he's doing. Now, we know the Declaration of, the, of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Ho Chi Minh goes on to use some of the documents to say, it occurs on September 2nd, 1945, all men are created equal. They are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable, inalienable rights, among them by life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement made, was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have a right to live, to be happy and free. Then he goes on to show that you know, this, this is a man who's well-read, well-versed and very knowledgeable. He then quotes the Declaration of the Rights of Man from the French Revolution. 
The French Revolution got its inspiration from the American Revolution. As I mentioned to my modern European students yesterday, think about this. In France in 1789, the French Revolution begins in 1789, the same year that the Constitution was ratified. You don't get that without an American Revolution. So the Americans have thrown off the colonial domination of the British and somehow won. They figured out that the Articles of Confederation were too deficient to run a government like the United States or a country that was expanding fast even then. Constitutional Convention from spring through summer 1787, they sent it out to the 13 separate states to get their nod on it, they ratified it. And then the French seeing that, if, they, if the Americans can throw off an absolute ruler like King George III, why can't they get rid of their own called Louis XVI? Particularly in a nation where, you had, where you, they had lost the French and Indian War, a seven year conflict, which was global and on land and sea. They had lost their North American possessions. They had come to the aid of the Americans in 1778 and the United States was broke in 1778 and had no way of paying the French back after the American Revolution. So the French economy has taken a hit twice within 20 years. And they've had a series of bad harvests. They have a king who is incompetent and out of touch. He prefers to make cl fix clocks that to attend to the needs of the people. People are being arrested and thrown in jail, not being told why or how long they're being, gonna be in jail. The people in France are ready for a revolution and they have an example of one across the Atlantic that worked. So all the things come together in 1789 for the French Revolution. And just as in the tradition, of the American Revolution, they write the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Ho Chi Minh knows that. Another revolution. He wants a revolution to get rid of the French out of Vietnam. He also has the, the, the significance of the Haitian Revolution. Toussaint Louverture getting the French out of Haiti. So he's quoting history and using all these precedents to justify what he wants to do in Vietnam. In 1946, the French tried to give the, the offer the Vietnamese limited to rule. They say, no way. Now, there was a very narrow window of opportunity here for, you, for the United States to establish good relations with Vietnam. September 14, 15, 1945, 13 days after the Japanese have surrendered on the USS Missouri. Major Ellis I. Thomas of the OSS asked Ho Chi Minh, are you a communist? Ho Chi Minh to Major Thomas, yes. But well, we can still be friends, can't we? Short answer, no. Not in the environment that was already changing fast and deteriorating between East and West in 1945. I mean, you know, when you think about it, it should make our heads spin about how fast the situation changed between East and West. And again, let me say, this is not to say that the Russians or the communist Chinese should have been trusted to be anything other than who they were. Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin never tried to hide who they were and what they had done. Stalin killed millions of people, especially during the Hamadador during the 1930s when he starved Ukraine with attempt to collectivization. But in this brief window of time, the history of America and Vietnam could have been changed. I'm sure what I'm putting up here right now, I wanted to share with you all, this is what I got from the trip that Dr. Van Stoop and I took to Vietnam with the students in 2019 before all the stuff with the pandemic happened. Our in-country coordinator, Tuan, Tuan, Trin Tuan, Tuan came to, came to, I met Tuan in the, in the hotel lobby one evening. He wanted, to have a, he wanted to have a meeting with me. He had several documents. He said, I'm gonna give these to you, but I want these back tomorrow morning. He said, this is from something called the Vietnam America Friends Association. That's what that stands for, VAFA. You'll notice that the date says 1945, November, 1945. So some months after the, it's about two, three months after World War II has ended. The Vietnam American Friends Association was a group of Vietnamese who were looking to establish diplomatic, economic, and political ties with the United States. First relations between Vietnam and the Western world. Let me truncate this by just reading a little bit of this. But what shall we give the US in return? We shall open our door to it. In other words, we shall adopt an open door policy in the economic field. The American products are overflowing the world. The American plants have taken the places of those of the whole world. So there is no reason why we should not consume American-made goods as the British, the French, and everybody in the world is doing. Vietnam will be a new market for the American manufactured goods. And what is more, we do not see any reason why the Americans should not, be build, should not build up a Ford plant 
in our own country. Moreover, Vietnam will also be a source of supply for the American industry. Our country is potentially rich. This is something that if you're an American manufacturer, American manufacturers and businesses since the founding of this country has always looked for another market to dump its products. The Vietnamese are saying, pick me, dump them here. That's very rare. They went on to say, our country is potentially rich. By ensuring the Vietnam market, the Americans have nothing to lose and everything to gain. But what about the French who are dominating us? They are exactly in the same situation as we are in relation to the US. And we shall not be childish enough to buy our goods through the French hands at a higher price than if we purchase them directly from the, from the USA. They're making calculations about who is better to be, to be doing business with. Tuan gave me some other documents that show, let me see about, about this one. Look at this one, it says, hope. America's professed love of freedom for standing for the liberation of, of, the, of the oppressed peoples, her desire of building up a grand world had greatly helped to give birth to the Vietnam, to the Vietnamese hopes and to keep them alive. The US have been the first to grant the slaves their freedom. The League of Nations have had President Wilson as his father. The Atlantic Charter bears President Roosevelt's signature. The UNO, the United Nations, the, United, the UNRRA, the United Nations Charter saw their day in the USA and had the US as their nurse, if we may say so. Indeed, the Vietnamese people in placing an immense hope in the US, what will it be returned? Deception or satisfaction? After contributing to the liberation of so many people, will the US stop halfway and refuse to bring some help, at least a moral one, to the Vietnamese people? They're citing the League of Nations, the creation of the United, the United Nations, the four freedom speeches by Franklin Delano Roosevelt before his meeting with Winston Churchill in early 1941 when they signed the Atlantic Charter. And understand that early 1941, Winston Churchill and, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt are signing the Atlantic Charter, talking about the world after the war ends. Essentially saying, when we win this thing, they don't know they're gonna win anything. And then, frankly, in March 1941, it looks like what's going on, they're doing anything, especially in Europe, there's a lot going on, but it doesn't look like winning, not at all. So it's as very aspirational, very lofty. But in the Four Freedom Speech, Franklin Delano Roosevelt says, people around the world, not just in America, people should be free, they should have freedom of speech, freedom of worship. Because if you have freedom of speech, that means that you live in a country where the government, the culture, is situated so that you can say anything you want, repugnant or otherwise positive, and the government gives you the room to say it, and you won't be arrested and thrown in jail for it. That's called liberty, freedom of worship. You live in a country where the ideology is so secure enough in itself, it doesn't mind if you have a competing interest called God or Buddha or Allah. You can work to whatever you want because we are secure enough as a democracy that will not be a threat to us. We don't have to be the only belief game in town. You should be free from fear. If you're free from fear, that means you have a, a, you have a civil society that's laws and customs, and there, there's a line called laws that people can go too far in where there are consequences. Freedom from want. Everybody should have the right to clothing, shelter, food, the four freedoms. They cover a lot of territory, but they pretty much make up human existence. This is what the Vietnamese are talking about. This is the example that America has set. This is what they were hoping for. It's 1945, 1946. This is from December, 1945. I stayed up all evening in that hotel. When Tawan gave me these documents, I stayed up all night into the wee hours of the morning, into the early morning, taking pictures of each one of these pages out of four documents. I wasn't very much used the next day but I got everything I needed on my iPhone and transferred it over to, a, to another file. So that's what the Vietnamese are saying in 1945, early 1946. There are only four documents that I had from Tuan. I think the VAFA lasted only about maybe two or three months. It was very short lived because things went downhill very fast between East West relations as indicated by this symbol right here, the Cold War. America had a choice to make. The Vietnamese are crying out for help. Africa is still colonized. And we're preoccupied with what's going on in Europe, understandably, rightfully, particularly when it comes to Berlin. 
again, you see where the, you see where the Soviet Union is and where the NATO troops and where the NATO members are. In 1946, Winston Churchill came to America and made a speech at Fulton, Missouri, where he said that an iron curtain had been drawn across Europe. By that he meant Soviet tanks and artillery, the Red Army, where they went again, as Mr. Neff said, where they went, they stayed. So things were definitely very, very tense. My best friend, when he joined the army, he was with the, with the third armor division. He went on something, he went on a military exercise in the 1970s and 80s called Reforger. He said that the Russians, when they were doing military exercises, what they would do with their, T, their T-72 and T-80 tanks, they would sometimes come up, they would come straight at you. They come up right before they got to the board, they turn around and go back. They're always just kind of you know, probing and pressing to see how far they could do something and get away with it. In 1950, the Korean War broke out when North Korea invaded South Korea, pushed UN and American and South Korean forces into the Pusan perimeter you see, by September 14, 1950, General MacArthur, the military governor in Japan, was ordered by President Truman to take charge of the situation. He did. He chose to land at one of the worst ports in the, on Earth for an amphibious landing, Inchon. MacArthur's, MacArthur's aides and his advisors were apoplectic when he chose Inchon. It's got poor port facilities. This channelizing the troops will be blown out of the water. You got unpredictable tide movements. You know, the channelization, there's not enough built up facilities. MacArthur said, I know all that. So the North, the North Koreans, which is why they won't expect us to come there. They landed and it was a total success and the North Korean advance was reversed. By July, by later that year, November 25th, 1950, it looked like the war might be over in Korea, except that they were bombing too close to the Korean Chinese border along the Yalu River. The Americans got word diplomatically through back channels, through India primarily, that if you keep on doing this, this is coming from Mao Zedong, who had just recently established dominance over mainland China. Now, the last thing Mao Zedong could afford as a new dictator in China was Americans on his border, because what he has to do now is consolidate power inside of China. He fought the Japanese. He said a long running civil war with Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek is now on Formosa, we call it Taiwan. And now he wants to consolidate his victory. And then the Americans show up. Nobody listened to his warning, so they came in on the side of the North Koreans. And to this day, we were in a stalemate with North Korea. I tell my students all the time that just because shooting stops doesn't mean that peace is broken out. We have a ceasefire, which is exactly what it says. We need to understand that this thing called the domino theory was very alive and well. And look, it wasn't imaginary because in 1949, Mao Zedong takes control of mainland China. North Korea invades South Korea. There was, a, there was a communist insurgency in the Philippines. In fact, the communists are still in the Philippines. They're called the Huck Balahap. When I was growing, when I was growing, <laughs> when I was growing up in the Philippines, my mother, my mother used to sit up and say stuff, if you don't, if you don't be good. I'm gonna give you to the hook, they'll cut your head off. I told my mother later on, I said, you should be glad that there was something called children's services in the Philippines. <laughs> and there, was also, there were also fears of communist insurgencies in Tibet, Burma, Thailand, and of course there were, there were, there were communists in Vietnam. So in the world to somebody in 1954, 55, the world looked like it was going red because all of Russia was red. Eastern Europe was red, China was red. And then in 1959, this happened. Fidel Castro came to America asking for assistance to get rid of Fulgencio Batista, the admittedly brutal dictator in Cuba. He was a brutal dictator. Batista was everything Castro said he was. It's just that Castro forgot to tell us who he was. And you know, Eisenhower, the President Eisenhower, who was known for having a famously quick temper, once he found out that he had been bamboozled, by Fidel Castro, he made a decision. He made a decision that would never ever happen again that would have implications for Africa. Now, so what, what does America do? You have these communists, these, this communist presence in Europe, a communist presence in Asia. What about Africa? African leaders and countries want their nations to be independent. What do we do? Which way do we go? 
America chose Europe. Their bigger priority was to offset Soviet presence in Europe, particularly when it came to Berlin, to stay committed to NATO. And the people on the African continent, they heard that, they, they heard that decision loud and clear. What begins to happen for people who are determined to get rid of the colonizer, they came to the West, meaning the United States asking for help, and they were turned down. Their desires have not changed. They still want to get rid of the colonizer. You can't get it from the West, guess who they turn to? The East, the Russians, who are only too happy to help them. And the moment they do this, and this becomes a common theme throughout the Cold War, the moment they turn to the, to the East, and not necessarily to just Russia, but to either Czechoslovakia or to Romania or Hungary, the moment they, the moment they do that, they're seen as being aligning themselves with the communists, and then they're put on America's hit list. And it's very, very pragmatic. It's very, very transactional. Robert Mugabe, the former leader of Zimbabwe, when he was fighting the Chimarengo Wars, I read an article one time, one time where Mugabe was asked, are you a Marxist-Leninist? He said, yes. Then he said, are you a capitalist? He, was, he said, yes. They asked him another question, he said yes. In other words, Robert Mugabe would be whatever you needed him to be to get what he needed to get from you to get rid of the white minority government in Rhodesia. Rhodesia named after, named after Cecil Rhodes. Rhodesia for a long, long time had a, a, a white minority, apartheid-like government, just like South Africa did. And so Mugabe said, I'll be whatever you need me to be, just give me the weapons. That was the part that we failed to hear. In the meantime, while we're choosing Europe, back in Asia, particularly at a place, particularly at a place called Dim Ben Phu. This is, these are pictures from where I was there in 19, 19, 2017 with the, with the students, Dr. Van Stoop. Dr. Van Stoop wears those orange tennis shoes that when we're in Vietnam, I told the students you can see those things from space. <laughs> but we, were we took pictures of the bunkers at Dim Ben Phu. This is where the French, this is called the Waterloo of French colonization. This is the Vietnamese beat the living tar out of the French at Den Ben Phu and changed the entire direction of what happened in Southeast Asia. And in the meantime, in Africa, you can see that those dates here, you can see the beginning of an independence movement. Angola is gonna fight a war from 1961 to 1974. Ghana will become independent in 19, 1957. Togo, 1960. Guinea, 1968. Sao Tome, 1975. You know, when you consider the, some of the dates of some of these things, this is recent history, right? 1975, are you kidding me? Guinea-Bissau in 1974, Sierra Leone in 1961, Guinea in 1958, Ivory Coast 1960, Benin 1960, Nigeria 1960, Cameroon 1960, Gabon 1960, Congo 1960. Congo becomes Zaire in 1960, Burundi 1962, Uganda 1962, Rwanda 1962. The early 1960s are just a, a cascade of independence movements. And you want to see the, 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 schiz the schizophrenia of American policy in Africa happens particularly in this area of the former Belgian Congo. Now, this is, named, this is renamed Zaire after a kleptocrat named Mobutu Sese Seko comes to power in the 1970s. But in the Congo, what you've got is once it, be, once it gains independence from the Belgians, in 19, I think in 1961, they will elect a man named Patrice Lumumba as their first, so far to this day, Patrice Lumumba is still the only democratically elected prime minister the Congo's ever had. The Belgians, they, they disengaged like this. This is how vindictive they were. While they were colonizing the Congo, they made sure that only Belgians or the Africans they selected to be the qualified ones, very limited number of people working in government, so that when they left, they had trained nobody, nobody knew how to run anything. They wanted it set up so that the government would collapse. And it kind of did. So when things started to happen after they left, the Belgians, who the people in Congo needed, and Patricio Lumumba had his enemies among the Congolese. His enemies called the Belgians back into, back into the Congo. And because Patricio Lumumba had made nice with the Russians, he was labeled a threat by the Eisenhower administration. Now, 
Lumumba was identified as a threat, as a communist sympathizer. He was anything but. And he was eventually arrested and assassinated. They cut his body up and then dissolved it in sulfuric acid because apparently just killing him wasn't good enough. I cannot verify this, but I read a number of reports that say that the CIA was not behind it, but had a hand in it. And in this way, the Congo, one of the most mineral rich areas on earth then and now, everything that you have in your cell phone, your computer screen, your TV, so many things that we use today, they have a screen on it. There's a sort of rare earth mineral that comes from the, the Congo and just maybe two or three other places on earth. It is extremely valuable. And it's mined in the Congo, which, and because the West, you know, turns a blind eye to what goes on in the Congo, there's a lot of slave labor going on there, a lot of human atrocities, and warlords pretty much run a big part of the Congo. Kwame Nkrumah becomes the first independently elected, the first democratically elected leader of, of Ghana in 1957. And then, like I said, you can see it's just one after another, some of like dominoes. What about America's relationship with Vietnam? Too late. By 1957, the French have lost at Dien Bien Phu and were already sending advisors to South Vietnam to, to prop up the South Vietnamese government. Then in August 5th, 1964, a report comes across the American papers that says a US destroyer was attacked by three vessels from the Vietnamese Navy. Two days later, Congress passed something called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing President Lyndon Johnson to take any measures he believed were necessary to retaliate and to promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. This resolution became, as it says here, the basis for the Johnson and Nixon administration's prosecution of the war. Does the word blank check mean anything to you? Take any measures, what might that be? What, do, what is it, what's included in that? Take any measures he believes were necessary. How do you define necessary? One president's necessary may not be the same as another president's necessary. You talk air, land assets, air, land, sea, what? How long? What's the exit strategy? If you look at Colin Powell's doctrine in the early 1990s when we fought Iraq, Colin Powell, who was a company commander, a commander of troops on the ground in Vietnam, everything that he did in Iraq is a reversal of what happened in Vietnam. He had a plan to get in a metric for what success looked like and when to, uh, when to announce success and a timetable for getting out. Get in, fight hard, overwhelm them, beat them, then leave. Not so in Vietnam. In 1969, so Vietnam was a lost cause for America by the mid 1960s. But in 1969, we turn our attention back to Africa. In 1969, Richard Nixon is president of the United States. As you all know, 1969 was a very turbulent period in the United States. You know, the, the, the space program distracted us, thank God. And there'll be that moment when, on July 20th, when Neil Armstrong steps on the moon and millions of people around the world were shared in that very human moment. But as far as the African continent was concerned, it was kind of business as usual. In 1969, Richard Nixon's policy, foreign policy toward Africa was laughable to say the least. It stank. One example of that is that Richard Nixon's foreign policy, Richard Nixon, listen, you know, as they say, sometimes you just can't make this up. Richard Nixon's foreign policy in Africa was called tar baby. Now, as you can see, tar, brave, tar baby was based on the stories from Joel Chandler's Uncle Rima stories that Walt Disney took and popularized in this, well, the cartoon, the tar baby. And the tar baby was said to be so the story goes, Br'er Rabbit, there on the left, was walking down the road one day and saw this doll made out of tar, started talking to it, and the doll did not respond because after all, it's a, it's a tar doll, it's not alive. And so Br'er Rabbit got offended that this being, you know, his Southern manners were offended. So he decided to fight the tar baby and he swung and punched it in the nose and got, his hand got stuck in the tar. He tried to pull it out, then he kicked it, and his foot got stuck in the tar. He punched it again, then eventually, before it's all over with, Bear Rabbit's just covered in tar. Now, if your foreign policy for Africa is tar, baby, what that means is 
once you get stuck in it, you never get, you're never going to find a way to get out. It is, well, it's not complimentary at, at a minimum, right? At a minimum, at a minimum, it's not complimentary. And there came a moment, there came a moment where Richard Nixon, Secretary of State, William Rogers. Now, the Secretary of State is the point person on American foreign policy. That's the person she or he does what the president wants in carrying out their foreign policy initiatives. So William Rogers, Secretary of State, is in a meeting at the White House with Richard Nixon. There's Nixon, Henry Kissinger, his advisor, and the Secretary of State, the senior diplomat for the United States. And Nixon <laughs> says to Kissinger in this meeting, Henry, let's leave those folks to Bill and we'll take care of the rest of the world. I'll leave it to you to figure out what Nixon's priority was for the African continent. He supported apartheid, which the Africans noticed. He supported the white minority government in Rhodesia, which the Africans noticed. In other words, people on the African continent noticed that America was on the wrong side of their desires, again. So when Nixon says that, he essentially affirms, affirms America's position and what had been going on, or just reminds us of America's relationship with Africa and people of the African diaspora from the transatlantic slave trade, all the way through the transatlantic trade, through the area, the era of slavery, into Jim Crow America. Because believe it or not, there are people in the African continent who know that history. They really know it, and they know it well frankly, a lot better than a lot of Americans do. And they, they had no trouble taking America's Jim Crow history and drawing a direct connection to that with apartheid in Rhodesia and South Africa. America divested from South African apartheid only after significant protests, not just in this country, but around the world. In other words, once it became economically, it, as long as it was economically, too risky to say invest in South Africa, that's when they finally got out of there. So it was a big mistake. And then came 9-11. By 9-11, Africa had been like the sleeping, or should I say ticking time bomb. In 1993, Somalia ceased to be pretty much a functioning state. In 1993, U.S. Special Forces landed in the Horn of Africa in Somalia. Now, Somalia is valuable to the United States because first off, it has a window to the Indian Ocean. And it's got one of the best natural deep water ports in the world, Mogadishu. To the south, there's Mombasa down here in Kenya. And Tanzania's got a pretty good port as well. So for U.S. naval operations in the Persian Gulf, in the Indian Ocean, and the Mediterranean, Mombasa, the Horn of Africa are extremely geostrategically important. Mombasa ceased to have a functioning, it was a failed state, they called it. A failed state means that you were like Afghanistan in the 1970s. If you don't have a functioning government, people like Osama bin Laden can come into your borders, set up shop, run training, run training for terrorists, and you cannot control that. You may not even know about it. And if you do, there's nothing you can do to police it. You'll notice that Somalia is close to the Middle East. We have, a, we have an ally there called Israel. On the African continent, because North Africa, as I mentioned to you all in the first session, North Africa may be literally on the continent, but they identify religiously with Islam, and in many cases, culturally, with the Middle East. So it's Arabic Africa. Culture-wise, language-wise, they speak Arabic. A good number of people are the followers of Islam. So they are more tied to the Middle East than they are to the continent itself. It's only in Sub-Saharan Africa that the more popular notions of Africa that Americans might know about begin to have some type of relevance. So Al-Qaeda found, Al found a place, a home in Northern Africa and also other parts of Africa. We were worried about Morocco, which had been a long, long, and still is a very, very mostly reliable ally. But then something happened in 2011 called the Arab Spring, where there was a guy, an incident in Tunisia that eventually caught fire in Libya and then Egypt. Now, they got, they got rid of Muammar Gaddafi in, in Libya. You know, there are a few, there are, there are, there are, there are really some times where the, the, the removal of a person from humanity really does make the world a better place, and Gaddafi is one of those individuals. 
the world improved the day he left. He was the one that was behind the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockheed B. Scott in 1988. So they get rid of him, but unintended consequences because in Libya, a civil war breaks out. Libya is still in a state of civil conflict. In Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, people tried to remove him and they got rid of him, but Egypt now is, is, is democracy, is not necessarily in peril, but it doesn't look like it used to. Not it, and it wasn't very strong to begin with. Sudan, Sudan had to be cut into half into North Sudan, South Sudan. The Air Spring, that people over here in, the, in America, look at what's going on. People in the Middle East, in Africa, they are trying to take the starting democracies from the ground up, which is the way it should. We tried democracy, democracy from the top down in Iraq. That doesn't work so well. And then they got to Syria to remove Bashar al-Assad. Bashar al-Assad is the son of Hafez al-Assad. In the 1970s or 80s, people in Syria rose up to try and get rid of Hafez al-Assad and he put them down brutally the same way that Bashar al-Assad, his son has been doing. There are millions of Syri Syrian refugees who are now in Europe. They have left the Middle East. They have caused crises and instability. They have tried to get into Hungary. It's caused the rise of ethnocentrism and a move toward the right and otherwise democratic governments. It caused racial strife. People don't want those people. They look different than we are. They speak a different language and they're followers of Islam. It's caused an economic crisis, the biggest one since World War II. It is a humanitarian disaster, unmitigated. And then in Nigeria, an Al-Qaeda ISIS uh, offshoot, Boko Haram, has been operating. You all will recall that a few years ago, there were about somewhat like 200 some odd girls who were kidnapped. And they couldn't find those girls for a week. And when they did find them, they didn't find all of them. So these guys, these guys engage in kidnapping, Extorting money from people. What you see at the top there, ECOWAS, that ECOWAS stands for the, the Economic Community of West Africa. There's something else called ECOMOG, which stands for the Economic Monitoring Group. Now, these two organizations were founded because the West Africans said African problems should be resolved by African people. Great, I agree with you, except that they generally don't have the infrastructure or the kind of governmental, the governmental culture of long-standing culture that will allow them to operate unfettered without corruption. We know that there's corruption in the American government, but the American government can still occasionally get something done. And then there's this, is, then there's this issue with Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau has been identified by the UN a number of years ago, I think in 2008, as being the world's first narco-terrorist state. In other words, the drug dealers run this place. And drugs are being smuggled from South America across the Atlantic Ocean into Guinea-Bissau. Let me show you another map. You see how it's going to Guinea-Bissau and into Luanda, Angola, into Maputo, into Mozambique. Then it goes further east to Australia and then north to North Africa, across the Mediterranean into Southern Europe, and in some cases going back across the North Atlantic to America. Bear with me as I read this. Guinea-Bissau, one of the world's poorest nations, has become a trans, has become a major transshipment hub and the epicenter of, in Africa for the cocaine trade, according to U US, European, and UN officials. Some of the world's richest criminal gangs are exploiting barely functioning countries such as, such as Guinea-Bissau, which has 63 federal police officers, no prison, and a population that still lives largely in thatched roof huts huts, homes, on dirt roads with no electricity or running water. West Africa is under attack, said Antonio Maria Costa. By the way, Guinea-Bissau is a former Portuguese colony. Executive Director of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, who recently visited Guinea-Bissau and concluded that it is so overrun by the cocaine trade that it could become Africa's first narco state. Strong currencies in Europe, where cocaine sells for twice as much as in the United States, is a magnet for the cartels. Why is, this, why is this a problem for America? Here's why this is a problem. One of many reasons. The cartels also have to finance terrorist operations. So there's the war on drugs, how, whatever you think about that, but the money from the people that sell those drugs are used to buy arms and weapons to finance 
people like ISIS and Boko Haram. They may, not have any, they may not have any interest in selling drugs. They do have an interest in attacking the United States, though. So America pays, America snubs or does not pay attention to this at our own peril. Because just like we found out on 9-11, we may not have been at war with them, but they had been at war with us. And then one day, they, on a 9-11, they finally let us know. Another map showing the cocaine route from Latin America to Europe. And you see this time it goes through not so much far south in West Africa, but it's going through, going through Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire. And you, you see it's coming from Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. Transit area one, Mali and Mauritania. Transit area two, the Cape Verde Islands. Transit area three, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. This is why in the 1990s, when the Sierra Leoneans were going through this civil war and the, Liber the, 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 the Liberians were going through this civil war, Liberia lost a quarter million people during that civil war, a quarter million people. It was bizarre to see what they were doing over there. If you have not seen the, if you have not seen the movie Blood Diamond, it's Hollywood, it's dramatization, but it gives a good idea of the utter insanity of what was going on. It destabilized those two countries destabilize all of West Africa. Let's put it like this. Charles Taylor, who was what they call an American Liberian, Charles Taylor was descended from Black Americans who went back to Africa in the 19th century. Somehow or another, I don't know what he did, but he, he was in jail in Massachusetts. Somehow was freed, made his way to back to the African continent, contacted Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, was trained in a terrorist training camp, got some weapons and some followers, and then moved south from Libya into, into Burkina Faso, and then crossed the, the, the border into Liberia and began to agitate with other people at the time to get rid of Samuel K. Doe. Now, Samuel K. Doe was the guy who in 1978 overthrew the American Liberian government. He took everybody from the, the American Liberians and people, indigenous Liberians, hate the American Liberians, and for good reason. When the black slaves, when the black people got from America to Liberia, they did to the indigenous Africans what Europeans did to Native Americans in North America. They took the best of everything. They ripped off people. They took the best land, the best resources. They took the best and made a two-tier society. And they never failed to let the indigenous Africans know that they were not good enough. After about 100 years of that, they got tired of it. The indigenous Africans did. So Master Sergeant Doe took over the government in 1978. He took all of the government ministers out to the beach, tied them to a pole, and shot them. That began a process where, for a moment, Liberia was, in a, was America's darling because Samuel Doe said one thing that made, him, that made him the love of the Reagan administration, which was, I am an anti-communist. He could get anything he wanted. Here's Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau is near Guinea, Senegal. So there's a threat, as it is, with Al-Qaeda still out there. We know, we know they're still out there. We know, the, we know that there was a recent report about an ISIS raid on a Syrian prisoner, or rather a prison. So we know that, that ISIS is still out there, alive and kicking. The, you know, these people, they, they, don't, they don't just go away. They just find a new hole to crawl into. And when you have a continent that is as rich in resources, and I have not really been, I have not, have not really done justice to Africa. It is not a complete, a place full of civil war and, 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 and chaos and so on. I'm a foreign policy person. I'm fascinated by it, so I, that's what I focus on. I've been in Kenya at least five or six times. I've been in Cameroon. I've been in Morocco. I got some of the best lobster I've ever had in Morocco. I have been, I have been in, in, in Tanzania. I went to the, to the International Tribunal for the Rwandan genocide. People were on trial there in 2004. So Africa is an amazing, amazing continent with 54 countries, 2,000 languages, and innumerable dialects, and wonderful, wonderful people. But it is also a place that is very challenged across the continent and offers some chaos opportunities for people that are not seeking to do us any good. And I'll close like this. One of, the, one of the strangest experiences I ever had 
you know, which just shows the conundrum of being a black American on the African continent was when I was on visiting there in Cameroon in 2006, seven. And there was my, my roommate was a guy from, from Arkansas. Marty was a, Marty's a big, big strapping tall black guy with a, he used to be a football player. And we were there, we we're the only two black Americans in the whole group. And we're sitting there one evening with the Cameroonians and having a, having a pretty good time. And they started talking about how, you know, America does this. America exploits these people. And America, you know, is, is, is evil over here. And this is wrong with the United States. And Marty and I were sitting there like, well, wait a minute. Hold on a second. You know, we, 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 just, we just went to your, we just went to your capital, to your Department of Education, where the, where the minister admitted to us that they don't really have any kind of real authority to implement educational policy because out there in the, in the rural areas, people are pretty much, the education is run by NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So the, the Cameroonian government has no teeth to make policy. So all, and he said to us, what we do is basically write policies that get put on the shelf. I said, you sound very much like America. But they have no, they have no authority in the area. I said, so you wanna just what, getting paid to push paper, essentially. And they complained about corruption and their president, Paul Bia, had been, had been president since what, 1972? This was 2006. So, and, it's, and they call it a democracy. There are, there are differences between, be, between Francophone Cameroon and Anglophone Cameroon. They have, they have had civil conflict over French speaking people, and English speaking people. I said, that's it? That's, that's the difference? So they were sitting there telling us about how awful American, uh, America is. Marty and I, got tired of it and, and we stood up and said look we don't care what you think about our country but understand this this is our country and we're not going to sit here and just let you sit up and badmouth America and not get any kind of pushback okay so if you want to have a civil discussion we can talk about that and then they took it to a new level and I said, look, you know what? We wouldn't be in America in the first place if y'all hadn't sold our relatives in the first place. <laughs> so before you start talking about how bad America is, check your own closet. How about that? Well, can I just say that we, weren't in a, we were not invited to the party later the night, that night? <laughs> I will take your questions. <laughs> yes. Or is that a form of colonization? It is a form of colonization, but it's a form of economic colonization. That's a very good question. It's a very good question. It's a very good comment, very good observation. China has a big, China, not just China, but believe it or not, North Korea has a footprint in Africa. I mean, when have they had the resources to invest in anything? So the North Koreans are trying to gain influence in Africa. The Chinese have, in Kenya, there's something called the Mombasa Road, or the, 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 the China Road. It, it, connects, it connects Nairobi to Mombasa. It's at least, I think, to get from Nairobi to Mombasa, it's about maybe five, possibly six hours. And it's a very smooth, very well-developed, very well-built highway, but not built by the Africans. It was built with Chinese money, Chinese material, and Chinese laborers. It was believed that during the Rwandan genocide of 1994, that the Interaham way, the Hutus, who committed the atrocities, that they bought a lot of their, their pangas, their machetes from China, made in China. And they used those to hack people to death. I tell my students that, you know, you spend, at the end of the Rwandan genocide, they killed close to a million people in 90 days. You know how, do you, you know, when you kill a million people in 90 days, that means you have no time to do nothing but hack people to death. That's a lot of people. You could practically do nothing else but just hack people to death for 90 days running. And they got those, a lot of those from China. So China's got a big footprint. China's got a, vo a big footprint in Central America, South America. And I think that's why President Obama, before he left office, was trying to re reorient American foreign policy so much from Europe to Asia, partic particularly East Asia. Good comment, good question. Yes. Uh, you referred to Mobutu as one of the worst of uh, autocratic dictators in Africa. Mobutu, I said he was a kleptocrat. Mobutu, yeah. was, Mobutu was so corrupt. 
I read something where he was so corrupt and such a thief, he made other corrupt thieves embarrassed. But here's my question. Kabila, the second Kabila, is now supposedly the president of the Congo. Has anything changed from the Mobutu era? You're talking about Laurent Kabila. Yes. Right? right. So yeah, so Laurent Kabila, who's now in charge of uh in, in charge of in charge of um the, the Congo, the DRC Democratic Republic of Congo, not a whole lot has changed. The warlords are still in control in the countryside. And the the the, the second Kabila, as you can, I think the first Kabila was assassinated. He's the one, he's the one that got, got, got rid of Mobutu and his and, and his cronies. But the son, Laurent Kabila, is pretty much just the mayor of Kinshasa. His power doesn't extend any farther than the capital, Kinshasa. Because out, out there in the countryside, it's the warlords or the local chieftains that have control. Just like in Cameroon, where, where I mentioned to you all the last time, the government officials, when they, when they go north to the Cameroonian Nigerian border and they, they contact those hereditary rulers, those hereditary rulers that they're called the Fonz, those guys are in charge. I, can't, I did not meet not one government official that says we go, to, we go out there to the, the areas in the northern part of the country and tell them what to do. It's the other way around. They go out there and ask for permission, whatever they're allowed to do. So same thing, I think, in, in, in the DRC, I had, a, I had a student, Laura Nessel. L Laura, when she graduated, she moved to, she went directly to the Congo. I don't know what she was thinking about, but she went to, to, to the Congo. She wanted to, to work, with, work, work with kids there, and she did. And she was there in the midst of warlords and all kind of things that happened. I was worried for her on a number of occasions. She would write me, email me, and I would say, look, just take care of yourself. But it was through her eyes that I learned that things in the Congo are very dicey, to say the least. But you're right, the, the younger Kabila has proved to be no more of a solution to things than the older one was. The, 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 if there's any virtue to the older Kabila, it was that, that he finally got rid of Mobutu. With your extensive knowledge and, and uh, judgment based on Cold War policy, if you had a, a chance to talk to President Biden, what would you whisper in his ear? I would, I, I, I would actually ask him, you know, how many people have, have explained to him or pointed out, I'm sure somebody, somebody must have, you know, that the, the Russians have a historical reason for responding, I'm not trying to, you know, to, to, to see, th see the world through Vladimir Putin's eyes, but it might help to see the world through Vladimir Putin's eyes. That, you know, when, when NATO expanded to include Poland and other Eastern European countries, the Russians saw that as a threat. I heard one political scientist on NPR, you know, who was just beside us, he says, I don't understand why people can't understand this. And he says, I'm not agreeing with Putin. I'm not agreeing with the Russians. But for them to react this way, it's predictable, especially after World War II, because, Europeans, Asians, almost anybody other than Americans has a deeper appreciation for an understanding of history. The Russians lost 20, the Russians were savaged in World War II. Savaged to the point where German prisoners who went back to, went back to Germany were told, given express orders to not speak at all about what was going on on the Russian front. So German citizens, they found that anyway, German citizens were right to be terrified of the possibility to be dominated by the Russians because if there's ever such a thing as a payback, and that's, that's why towards the end of World War II, German soldiers just took off the uniform and fled toward the Americans. Because anything other than, other than to be captured by the Russians. So I would wonder, I would tell him, has anybody explained the historical connection between the czars, the commissars, and Vladimir Putin? And the Warsaw Pact and NATO and what that might possibly mean. And what, what does that mean? Does that, does that give them an off ramp? I don't know, but has anybody explained it to them? Because a lot of people seem to be very puzzled by this. Now, is he, is he power hungry? Of course he is. Is he expansionist? Of course he is. Does he miss the old Soviet empire? Of course he does. But he's also very shrewd. He survived, he came up through the KGB. If you survived that, that's, one, that's impressive all by itself. He survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. He survived Boris Yeltsin. So this guy's proven that he's got several lives. And I would wonder, just exactly what kind of intelligence briefings he's getting on Vladimir Putin himself and who is no more Sovietologist 
But if you talk to any, because Vladimir Putin is a product of, he's like anybody else, he's a product of his time, which means the Soviet Union, he envisions that for the future of Russia. And also, I'd ask him, has anybody found that stash of anthrax that was in, in Russia at the fall of the Soviet Union? Because to my knowledge, no one's found that chemical weapon. There's a nod. And then I finally asked Biden, can I sit for lunch? <laughs> Other questions? You want to hit in my sweet spot this morning. This is foreign policy stuff. And Fred, I, I have I, one can, in the chat. Yes, go ahead, Kim. From a historical perspective, was colonization even worth the consequences and the cost? Yes, interests benefited, but in terms of the cost of wars, loss of life, political instabilities, and damage to our overseas, were these policies a huge mistake? And if so, do we keep repeating the same pattern? Kim, you're, you're, you have a, your, your voice is echoing with the, with, the, with the stentorian dignity of a goddess. Oh. You know, it's, oh, it's, it's going on. I, let me what respond the same way, 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 way. Is this better? Yes. Can you read the question again? From a historical perspective, okay. was colonization even worth the consequences and the costs? Yes, certain interests benefited, but in terms of the costs of wars, loss of life, political instabilities, and damage to our image overseas, were these policies a huge mistake? And if so, why do we keep repeating them? And if so, what's the last part? Why do we keep repeating the same oh, pattern? Oh, oh, oh. Well, okay. Was colonization worth it? Believe it or not, there are some people that say colonization was worth it. Let me tell you, let me tell you what, I, what I read recently. This is, this is astounding. At least it was astounding to me. Colonization was worth it because after all, look what we did. We brought, we brought them Christianity. You know, and, 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 and commerce. <laughs> and, you know, civil, in other words, it sounded very much like the playbook out of the 19th century. So had it not been for this, then they wouldn't have that. Well, let me go back a little bit further in history. There's something called the encomienda. The encomienda was something that had to be granted by the Catholic Church to people who were coming to the new world and wanted to establish control over Native Americans. The encomienda said, look, I'm giving you my, my, my blessing, my authority, so that you can, you can establish your plantation and collect tribute from the Native Americans and protect them. Viewpoint of the Native Americans. I didn't need protection until you showed up. <laughs> Same thing with colonization. I didn't need protection until you showed up. When you arrive in somebody's living room saying, I'm bringing you religion, you already assume that they either have none or that what they have isn't good enough. I'm bringing you literature. You're assuming they're either illiterate. We've established that people in, in a good part of West Africa, in Africa, were followers of Islam, which means that they had to read the Quran, which means that they not only had to read, but they were also had to read, read Arabic. So the short answer was colonization worth it. I don't think exploiting anyone is ever worth it. It produced some side effects that we're continuing to live with to this very day. And why do we keep, why do we keep on repeating it? This is gonna sound so cliche, but because what is it? Was it Faulkner? I forgot the person that said the only thing that we the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. So if we took those lessons and really understood them and applied them, we wouldn't keep on doing these things. And you know, part of the challenge that, that we face is that every generation of people that's born on Earth, everything they do is for the first time to them. You know, if you get so far in life, you've heard that you've seen this movie several times. But for them, it's always the first time, and therefore, it's the end of the world, et cetera, and so on. When we have leaders who either don't know the history or don't care to know the history or dismiss it, that is problematic. Because there are some things that can be avoided because human beings, as it turns out, are not absolutely predictable, but they're predictable enough to where you can see echoes in things. And also, I think that a lot of times, we just have a failure to empathize people who are exploited on the continent and elsewhere, if we took some time, I think, to put ourselves in their, in their, in their shoes, then maybe our policies would be different. That's called humanity. That's my response, I, Kim. I have one more. Please. From Ben, 
you do a great job of teaching history from a global perspective versus a compartmentalized approach that many of us experienced and is still occurring today. This leads to a fragmented approach to our understanding and ultimately foreign policy. How do we change that as educators and a society? How do we change that as educators? I am, oh, I'm, I'm glad this question was asked. Uh, this, this, this leads me to, to let you all know, I'll be talking about, I guess I'll be talking about this issue on February 28th. I've been invited by the Spring Lake District Library to do a presentation on critical race theory. Now, do you know that two years ago, critical race theory, you know what they called, you know, you know what's called then? It's called teaching history. <laughs> here's, here's a question that I have, Kim, uh, relative, to, relative to the question. How do we change it? One, you don't change it or you, you, you don't improve it by shying away from it. When I was in graduate school, we spent a lot of time in some of my seminar classes talking about what is history supposed to do? And it turns out history is not supposed to do anything other than inform us of the facts and the associated truths. Some people wanna feel good by it. Some people wanna take it and make other people feel bad by it. That's not the purpose of history. How do you find a good way of teaching about the Holocaust or the upside of the Holocaust? Some history is just awful. It just is. I went and visited Dachau in the 1980s because I wanted to go and be there in that, in that environment myself. I wanted to feel the wall. I felt the wall. I smelled the wall. Still had that odd odor, like the Zyklon B was still in it. Even decades later, I, it was creepy because I felt like ghosts were all around me, whispering me, whispering to me urgently to remember what they went, remember them, and to get it right when I talk about what they went through. There's no good way of telling that. The value of telling that, though, is because we know that there's been, there's been a transatlantic slave trade. There's been 246 years of slavery in America by Abraham Lincoln's count on March 4th, 1865. We know there's human trafficking today. We know human beings given the chance will do awful, terrible things to each other. And the way that we can do that, one way, one check against doing that is to, to remind ourselves of just exactly what we can be to each other as a species. Visiting Dachau reminded me of that and checked me and obligated me to tell that story with as much force and truthful conviction as I could whenever I talk about it. Dwight Eisenhower, when he visited the camp at Buchenwald, Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of Headquarters Allied European Forces, he was, he was written letters by George Patton, you know, old blood and guts, Mr. Blood and Guts charge, you know, charge to the front. Patton visited Buchenwald and told Eisenhower that he refused to go back and look at it anymore because it made him sick to his stomach. This is Patton, the tank commander, the one that slapped soldiers. So if one of, if one of Eisenhower's most aggressive commanders is abhorred by what he saw, and then Eisenhower, in response to, wrote a letter to George Marshall, the one for whom the Marshall Plan will be, laid, will, will be named after later on. Eisenhower wrote Marshall back in Washington, who was chief of staff of the army at the time, and he said to Marshall, you got to send photographers, journalists, senators, and congressmen over here to see this as much as possible. We got to get this in the written record. And Eisenhower said that because I fear, I'm paraphrasing, he said, because I fear a day may come where there'll be people who say that this wasn't real. It didn't happen. In other words, conspiracy theorists who want to sit up there and just dismiss it. And Eisenhower had the presence of mind to say, if we get this in the record right now, I don't know if it'll do any good, but at least they can't deny that it was there. And so the way to tell it, Kim, is to tell the truth and to do it from a standpoint, not without personal conviction. You can have personal conviction, but the history is there as a uniform body of information for us to be informed because being informed is better than not being, it's being better than being ignorant. And being informed is one of the fundamental elements of being a functioning Republican democracy. That's why it's good to know it. Amen to that. The last question I have is, what will Fred be doing for us next term? <laughs> Whatever my half scholars want. Okay. What do you all want to talk about? Everything. 
Okay. Okay. Critical race theory. That could be on the agenda for the fall because you've got the Emmett Till story going on in the summer. <laughs> okay, critical race theory. And uh, just so you'll know, I'm, I'm wearing a Kevlar vest up to Spring Lake. <laughs> no, I told, I told my students I, in the slavery and race class, I'm going up there and you know, I say, you know, sometimes you can't, you, you can't script this stuff. You know, the, the, they're talking about slavery and race, there's 28 of them and one of me. I said, you're gonna see, you're gonna see how this operates. I told them about when I was running for office, you know, I had one debate, well, I won't mention the candidate, but I had one debate in Cadillac. That mob up there, that, that mob that I met that night in Cadillac is why I'll never go back to Cadillac, never. That was the most racist mob of people I ran across north, south, east, or west. They were horrible. And this was in Michigan, which on the one hand is no surprise, but on the other hand is kind of disappointing. Very disappointing. So it exists in the South there. And so I'm, I'm, I told my students, I want them to come out there and watch this so they can see it real time. Because see, they still don't live in a world of theory. And, and well, they see it from a distance. They're going to get a chance to see what happens up close. I don't know what's going to happen. But whatever happens, they'll see it up close. You all are invited to come. When is it? February 28th. 6.30, I think. OK? It's great being with you. Thank you. Let's thank. Dr. Full Professor Fred Johnson.